Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. The Biden administration says it has a plan to end Israel's war on Gaza. But is a permanent ceasefire more elusive than ever? Let's get to the bottom line. After months of vetoing any attempt for a ceasefire in Gaza, the Biden administration has recently been pushing for Israel's plan to wind down the war, which has killed now more than 37,000 Palestinians and left the entire Gaza Strip in rubble, with almost no food, no water, nowhere safe to go. Biden's top diplomats were in the Middle East to press Hamas to accept the deal in three phases, starting with a truce and prisoner exchanges and winding up with negotiations on a permanent end to hostilities. And the United Nations Security Council adopted a resolution submitted by the U.S. in support of the deal. But given the epic levels of mistrust on all sides, will this work? Today we're talking with Michael Hanna, U.S. Program Director at the International Crisis Group. Michael, it's terrific to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I would like, if we can, to kind of get a um, um, version of, of reality of where are we right now on anchor efforts to... Uh, get a deal between Hamas, Israel, and the negotiating parties? Yeah, obviously, the United States has made a big push, a big public push. Uh, part of that was uh, President Biden going public with uh, what he described as an Israeli proposal. Uh, and I think that was meant to shrink the space uh, for both parties. Uh, and uh, uh, by shrinking the space of uh, 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 for what they could negotiate about, the effort was really to press the issue. Obviously, there's been a lot of support from the Egyptians and the Qataris as the kind of chief conduit to uh, Hamas. Um, and uh, we are apparently still hung up on what has been a kind of irreconcilable division um, on this question of permanence, which has bedeviled the talks for months now. Um, and, of course, the draft has changed. Uh, previous drafts only talked about a sustainable period of calm. Uh, and in this version of the proposal, uh, there is discussion of the end point of the second phase after various steps related to uh, primarily the exchange of uh, hostages and Palestinian prisoners, uh, that you would get to um, a permanent cessation of hostilities. Um, and this is, uh, in many respects, the key point for Hamas and the thing that they have focused on the most. Um, and the court, the sort of the caveat here is that they have received assurances in private for many months um, that if they follow through with the steps of the various proposals that have been on the table, that the end point would be an end to war. Uh, but of course, those. Uh, assurances first relayed to them from the Egyptians and the Qataris, um, and uh, then being amplified in private by the United States, um, have proved difficult uh, to uh, uh, assuage their fears, uh, their lack of mistrust. You mentioned mistrust. Uh, and so there has been a concerted push for many months now uh, by Hamas in each of these phases of the negotiations uh, to drill down further, to get greater and greater clarity on this point that is central to how they think about uh, these negotiations, and that is end of war, that if they go through uh, with this uh, plan, if they agree to this proposal, uh, that, uh, that the end point of that uh, will be a kind of uh, permanent cessation of hostilities. Well, let me just ask you about this terminology, permanent cessation of hostilities. Now, I have in front of me the words that President Biden used in this. And when he was describing the first phase, which he said would last for six weeks, he said it would include a full and complete ceasefire. And the President Biden is saying that, and I think that's language that Hamas was interested in, but it's hard to find anyone in the Israeli government uh, that actually agrees to that, even though President Biden says this was an Israeli proposal. So are we getting lost in semantics here? Are we talking about a ceasefire? Is Israel on board with the proposal that President Biden says it was? Yeah, that's been a central question, uh, because obviously we know what President Biden has said. He said it publicly that the Israelis had agreed to this proposal. Uh, and yet there's been a lot of discussion uh, in public, uh, language that would suggest that 
Israel is not fully on board. Talk about uh, continuing to prosecute the war. Uh, and so the question really is, one, whether this is uh, an attempt to manage domestic politics, right? Uh, the Israelis have to manage their own domestic politics. There are uh, concerns about uh, coalition government. Um, or if this is really an effort to seed mistrust, to undermine the proposal from the start, uh, and for Hamas, hearing uh, the Israeli rhetoric in public and then hearing U.S. Uh, and uh, Egyptian and Qatari assurances in private, um, it, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a particularly conducive approach to uh, trying to uh, bridge these, uh, what have been to date, uh, ir irreconcilable divides. Uh, and so that's, that's the you know, additional complicating factor. I think... For the United States, I think U.S. officials were, were not surprised at the public rhetoric. Um, I, I think uh, they are more concerned with what happens if they are able to get the, the deal started, uh, that that will create its own kind of momentum. But clearly, it's very unhelpful. Um, it seeds further mistrust. Uh, and, you know, there is this question that keeps recurring whether, in fact, the Israelis have agreed to this proposal. Is this an Israeli proposal? Uh, is this the United States uh, twisting Israel's arm? Um, are they fully on board? And, of course, Hamas is, is witness to all that back and forth, and, uh, and they have their own uh, uh, mistrust, um, and that has, this has really exacerbated that. So my question to you, if you were Hamas, and you listen to, you know, Tony Blinken and others saying, hey, if Hamas would just accept this plan everything would be great. I guess my question is trying to understand where both parties are. What is in this proposal, do you believe, that either Hamas or the Palestinians, there are a lot of people in, engaged in this conflict that are not part of Hamas who are suffering and who are victims of this conflict right now. Why would they trust this proposal? Well, I mean, that's the central question. That, uh, that is the issue uh, that uh, Hamas has raised uh, multiple times. Uh, they've asked for written guarantees, uh, but, but of course, you know, not even written guarantees can assure full compliance. Uh, and uh, and so, uh, you know, ba based on previous experience, uh, it's not surprising. Um, I think the fundamental question, in a lot of respects, is whether either side is actually interested in uh, in a ceasefire in the near term, or whether uh, both. Uh, see the politics is too complicated and and see benefit in in continuing and, and prolonging uh, the current war I mean I think the other innovation that we should mention in the latest uh, proposal um, is is the idea that if uh, if if total agreement isn't found on moving from one phase to the next that the ceasefire would remain in place uh, as long as the parties were negotiating in good faith. And, and this is movement in the direction of, of the proposal uh, that Hamas countered with last time, uh, because there is a fear on their part that, uh, that uh, Israel would pocket concessions, uh, that there would be some uh, release of uh, hostages and an exchange, uh, and then at some uh, later date, uh, the Israelis would uh, cite differences in, in negotiations and inability to bridge divides uh, and would resume the war. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of uh, uh, issue that's really at the heart of this, uh, whether um, there is anything to compel the two parties to move forward through the phases uh, or whether Israel, from Hamas's perspective, um, would have uh, a sort of free hand uh, to re-engage the war at a time of its choosing in the future. Recently, Michael, I'm sure that you uh, were aware of the Nusayrat raid, um, nearly 300 Palestinians killed um, in an effort to, to secure four hostages were being held. What did that incident do to the temperature of things uh, and, the, and the possible success of what President Biden is pushing? Yeah, obviously, it complicates each, each further step. Uh, you know, I think Hamas has talked about the Rafah offensive that President Biden and, and the rest of the administration warned against uh, as, as raising their uh, price. Uh, they, they've seen that as creating uh, further difficulties for uh, reaching an agreement. And I think, of course, 
You mentioned the, the, the raid over, over the weekend. Uh, and I think clearly, you know, it's not the sort of thing that is going to uh, enhance trust. Uh, obviously, uh, these are not parties that trust each other. Uh, it's been a, uh, a, a brutal uh, and prolonged war. Uh, and, you know, as we've seen, um, you know, bridging that divide, uh, what has been irreconcilable, you know, it, it might actually be irreconcilable. It might not be possible to use uh, vague language uh, to to get get the parties um, uh, uh, engaged in this process. And you mentioned a lot of the details uh, in in the proposal, um, as we understand it. Uh, but there's a lot that's not there. Um, it's silent on many of the biggest issues, and of course that has raised its own set of concerns. Um, you know, uh, the vagueness is probably the strength of this proposal because it's impossible to imagine these parties agreeing on the front end, uh, even to the contours of what this discussion would look like. Things like uh, post-war governance. Uh, the Israelis have been very reluctant uh, to even engage on this question of the day after uh, and uh, have not dealt with this in any realistic way. And so, uh, you know, it's not it's not reasonable to imagine that this document can solve those issues or even pinpoint them. Uh, but of course, even if we got to an agreement on entering the first phase, um, there is a lot that is undefined there uh, about how Gaza would be uh, governed, uh, the border re uh, regime. Um, you know, very difficult issues that cut to the heart of uh, of this conflict. That um, you know, there's very little guidance as to as to as to how those questions would be answered. Michael, how is it playing out in the region? Um, you know, with the Arab Street, with the street in Jordan, Iman going to Egypt and looking at Egypt, is there a strong empathy, a strong sense of uh, a real concern for the plight of Palestinians in Gaza? And I would even add the West Bank today, frankly, given the stress there. And do the regimes, do the governments in Jordan and Egypt run risks um, by not basically saying, hey, maybe we need to, to suspend our peace deal or maybe we need to create other kinds of pressure on Israel in this moment, which neither has done. Uh, but I'm just wondering about that divide and how fragile the neighborhood is given what's happening in Gaza. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think at times um, people have... Uh, uh, perhaps underestimated how live an issue this is. Uh, they have taken the actions of governments. We've seen, obviously, Egypt first, then Jordan, uh, and then the normalization agreements that have come to be known as the Abraham Accords uh, with the UAE and, and Bahrain. Uh, and the kind of very live discussion on Saudi normalization is indicating that, that really the region has moved on, that the conflict is only going to be managed uh, uh, henceforth, um, and, and that it had been neutered, that its kind of sub, uh, political significance had been neutered. And, you know, I think that's not true. You know, we've seen signs uh, that that is not true. And there is still, particularly at the popular level, a great deal of empathy, solidarity, um, outrage. Uh, the Palestinian cause is important to Arabs. It's important to the Arab world and uh, to many people globally. We see the way in which this conflict has uh, overtaken the global agenda, and that speaks to its unique political significance. So I think it's a mistake to underestimate that. I think the second point is that the region is concerned about uh, regional war, about escalation that, uh, uh, that we've seen happen incrementally over time, whether it be in the West Bank, whether it be uh, in northern Israel, southern Lebanon, but also in Iraq and Syria, also in, in the Red Sea with uh, stepped up attacks by the Houthis and counterstrikes in Yemen. Uh, and so the, the region is, is also uh, uh, very concerned about the possibility of a much wider war, uh, and a war, frankly, that if it escalated in those kinds of steps that really could be possible if you saw Hezbollah and Israel engage in an all-out war, a war that would draw on the United States. And so you know, that's the other piece of this that is of great concern. And of course, for the regimes looking on, it is uncomfortable. And I think it it further highlights the, the gap between these 
very cold pieces between mm-hmm. Egypt and Jordan. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the fact that it is, uh, it is a kind of peace between uh, security sectors. Mm. Uh, it is a, it is an absence of conflict and war, but there's no social people to people dimension uh, to, to these peace agreements. And, you know, that this conflict has, uh, this outbreak has, has really further highlighted that fact. Let me read you something that President Biden told Time Magazine last month. He said, there is every reason for people to draw the conclusion that Netanyahu is prolonging the war for his own political gain. I'm just interested in your thoughts on what you do if the Israeli prime minister politically and personally is the beneficiary of ongoing tensions, as you've got Biden and everyone else trying to calm things down, get to that sustained calm that you just talked about. We've seen over the past months uh, how uh, how incendiary this has been in American politics. Uh, and this is clearly not the issue that uh, an embattled uh, incumbent president uh, wants to be contending with, an issue that is, uh, um, you know, creating strife within the Democratic coalition, which is and always has been something of a broad tent. Um, and... You know, uh, in in a close election, which this uh, this election in, in in November will be, um, you know, any any kind of disruption of this sort, um, you know, might might uh, tip the balance. And so, um, I think that's led to some of this urgency now, uh, belatedly, I would add, uh, around this push uh, for uh, for a ceasefire. Um, there is a real need on the part of the Biden administration. Uh, to get this conflict under control. Uh, and uh, and again, this isn't the narrative or the discussion that a sitting president wants to have uh, as he enters a, a really closely fought uh, election campaign. So given what you see uh, out there, is it likely to get under control? Let me read you what uh, Deputy Secretary of State Kurt Campbell recently said. He said, sometimes when we listen closely to Israeli leaders, They talk about mostly the idea of some sort of sweeping victory on the battlefield, total victory. I don't think we believe that that is likely or possible, Kurt Campbell said. Well, I think a lot of people didn't see it in the cards from the start. Uh, And I think that's uh, part of the big problem. Um, And I think some of the rhetoric used by the Biden administration at the start that talked about uh, the the destruction of Hamas, which uh, I think was always uh, an unrealistic goal. And, And now... You see that echoed by uh, others, by senior U.S. officials. I I think that's salutary because it creates a more realistic environment uh, in which to uh, conduct these discussions. Um, But frankly, these these uh, facts were very clear uh, from the start. Uh, This is a embedded force fighting on its own territory, um, enmeshed in Gazan society uh, and uh, you know, I think there has been a, a disjuncture of sorts between the war that the United States wanted Israel to fight and the actual war that Israel was fighting. Right. You know, they're not fighting a counterinsurgency. Uh, if you look at the kind of total war that's being fought, um, you know, much of Gaza, Gaza is uh, is uninhabitable. You know, that's you know, they're not fighting a counterinsurgency, and so trying to prevail upon the Israelis to fight this uh, this other war that the United States uh, would like them uh, uh, to fight. Um, I think that's a that's a losing battle. Um, I think um, recent months have created some further sobriety about uh, the limits of, of what this uh, military campaign uh, can achieve. And, and I think it's very clear to most people that there is not going to be that that uh, complete total strategic victory, um, and, and of course that's a problem. I think for for Israel, I think Israel is concerned about the perception of its military uh, power um, and uh, not just deterrence with respect to Hamas, but deterrence more broadly, particularly with respect to Hezbollah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think. Uh, there are parts of the Israeli security establishment that have um, internalized that fact uh, and have begun to talk about this war in different ways. Uh, but there isn't going to be that total destruction of Hamas that uh, that I think Israeli leaders and, and some American leaders 
uh, talked about for some time, particularly in the immediate aftermath of October 7. You know, if you're if you're sitting in Israel's shoes, which I try to think about uh, with regard to these questions, and you've got a future that you're looking at of a rebuilt and a prosperous Gaza where, you know, there's some form of, you know, justice, hopefully autonomy, you know, some, some degree of civil society that's returned to health, which is very hard to imagine how you get there. I'm just really interested in this muddling, if you will, between long-term interests and short-term interests, the moment versus the long-term. Is there anyone in your sense that's thinking seriously about long-term interests of Israel with its neighbors? It doesn't look like it. I mean, there hasn't been a real peace process uh, in many in many decades at this point, frankly. And, and of course, the viability, uh, the possibility of some kind of two-state out outcome, um, you know, was potentially foreclosed years ago. Uh, we still talk about it uh, because people don't have a good sense of what else to talk about. Uh, but you know, there hasn't been a long-term vision. The long-term vision. Has been managing uh, managing this this conflict um, and managing the occupation, uh, and that uh, you know that has been how it has been dealt with, and of course that uh, puts the future further and further uh, at risk, uh, and, and is obviously a real tragedy for Palestinians living under that uh, under that reality. Uh, so you know we haven't had a long term vision. Um, I think that's been demonstrated in the way that the, this war has been uh, fought. Uh, there has been very little consideration for the day after. Um, I think uh, revenge was a, a chief motivating factor uh, in the way uh, in which the war has played out and the tactics deployed. Uh, and, um, and, of, and of course, as I mentioned, Gaza is much of Gaza is uninhabitable. Uh, you know, it's it is hard to imagine what this next phase looks like. Uh, I think people have have yet to really grapple with the size, uh, the enormity of, of, of the need. Uh, you know, it is not just in terms of, uh, of Palestinian dead, which is an enormous figure. And I imagine it will be a bigger figure than we are even talking about now uh, because of the difficulties of, of tallying in the midst of war. Um, but is, it is reconstructing uh, an entire society, and universities and hospitals and archives and uh, the the institutions that make life possible. Uh, you know, Israeli leaders, uh, I think it was uh, Defense Minister Gallant talked about uh, making Gaza uh, um, a city of tents again. And mm. well, you know, I think, you know, they, they might be successful, but, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's the outcome, that uh, that's an outcome that's going to be particularly conducive to uh, longer term Israeli security. Well, we'll have to sadly end it there. Uh, and I really appreciate your thoughts. You're so good on the Middle East. U.S. Program Director at the International Crisis Group, Michael Hanna, thank you for your comments today. Thanks for having me, Steve. So what's the bottom line? Forever wars like Afghanistan or Vietnam sometimes end abruptly with withdrawal of forces and both sides shaming and blaming the other. But at least the military operation ends. Other wars, well, they fade and fizzle out over years and decades, somewhat like Syria. And some conflicts do actually reach negotiated conclusions, like Bosnia. Despite the Biden administration's full court press these days, no one really knows which track Israel's war on Gaza is going to take. Negotiations have been going on for months, but what's clear is that a permanent ceasefire, a key Hamas demand, is really not in the language we're hearing. In the meantime, starvation is deepening, and just trying to survive in Gaza is getting harder and harder. What deal would put Palestinian society back together again in a way that's meaningful and fair? We are just nowhere near that answer. And that's the bottom line.